Turning for a scripture reading tonight to Exodus chapter 27. Exodus chapter 27. And we're reading from verse 1. <coughs> Exodus chapter 27 and verse 1. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans, all the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass, and thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass, and upon the net thou shalt make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof, and thou shalt put it on to the compass of the altar beneath, that the, the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass, and the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. Amen. And God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now tonight, uh, we're moving outside of the, um, the actual tent of the tabernacle, and we're moving straight out into the forecourt. Now, it's just a tent around, just an outer court with just a curtain around, and uh, uh, we're moving outside. We've had the Holy of Holies, and there we have the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments, and then we have its lid, and the lid is the mercy seat made of pure gold, and it was the mercy seat that separated the people or the priest when they came in from the law of God, and only Christ can stand between men and the law of God. And then moving into the holy place, uh, we've looked at that, and uh, on the left-hand side, as you look in, there would be the golden candlestick or the menorah, and that was the light for that place. And then on the other side was the table of showbread, and it was the 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes, and yet even the bread represented, it represents Christ, and it shows how Christ is in his people and his people in Christ. And then just before the veil well, then there you have the golden altar of incense. And that's what we looked at last week. And that is the place of prayer. And as the priest would be ministering in the place of prayer, he did so by the light of the candlestick on his left behind him. And the candlestick speaks of uh, the Spirit of God. And you and I can only meet with God in communion and in prayer when the Spirit of God enlightens us. And we need to bear that in mind when we come to pray. We, even the Apostle Paul in, in Romans 18, he talked about he did not know what to pray for as he ought. A man who had been a missionary for decades, a man who, I would say if you were in his presence, you would think, that man can pray. And you'd think that man maybe could learn no more. And yet he realized he could not pray aright without the help of the Spirit of God. So now we're outside the tent itself, and uh, there are two more pieces of furniture for us to look at. There are seven particular pieces that we're looking at in the tabernacle. There's just the laver outside of the, the tent, and then there is the brazen altar, which is the first piece of furniture that you come to when you come into the outer court um, surrounded by that, uh, that curtain. So we're coming to the brazen altar tonight. It's the biggest item of furniture. And I believe there's a significance there. It's the biggest of all. Now, other things were four foot and four foot six by three foot and three foot high and 18 inches square and things like that. This is seven and a half feet square and four foot six high. The biggest item, and I believe there is uh, significance in that, as there is significance in everything. Its name really gives away what the difference is. This is a brazen altar or an altar made of brass. Now, when you were in the holy place, in the holy of holies, not literally, but 
in your mind's eye or by faith. Everything was gold. But when you come to this outer uh, court and you come to the brazen altar, it's made of brass. And of course, brass speaks of judgment. The fire burned on this brazen altar continually. Uh, It was God who lit the fire. It was God who set the first sacrifice alight. And when the morning sacrifice would have been uh, set, it would have burned till evening. And in the evening sacrifice, it was put on top. And it never went out. But the point is, the fire that burned on that altar was not man-made fire. It was the Spirit of God. And it was God himself who lit the fire. And fire speaks of the Holy Spirit. And it, it makes us... It makes a very important point that as far as the Spirit of God is concerned, you can't manufacture His work. There are all sorts of people, and they will have this idea of working up some sort of a spirit in the meeting. It is the Holy Spirit or nothing. Uh, Nadab and Abihu were the eldest eldest sons of Aaron, and they thought they could make their own fire, and they offered incense with their own fire. And God slew them. God was very jealous of the fact that it is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit alone, uh, that has place in the worship of God. This daily sacrifice of this altar stood, and it was, com- it was smoking continuously. Not only was it smoking continuously, but it was continuously bloodstained. Because when the offering was made and the animal was slain outside uh, the outer court, the blood was collected and the priest would come in and he would dip his finger in that little dish of blood and he would paint it onto the horns of that altar. And that happened every time. This altar was completely, well not completely drenched in blood, but it was always marked by blood. There was not a sacrifice made where the blood was not placed upon the altar. And that shows the importance that the God, God has for the blood in sacrifice. Many people today, and they don't like this idea of a blood sacrifice. Many people today, and they, they, they sort of feel, well, we don't need to talk about those sort of things. It's not very palatable, and it's not very nice. But I think it was last week I said, There was nothing nice about Calvary. Calvary was one of the most, well, I think it's safe to say, the most awful scene in all of earth's history, both physically and spiritually for the Lord Jesus Christ. So this altar is always bloodstained. And yet the fact that it is always smoking, always bloodstained, it was always open to those who would come to it. And when those people knew that they had sinned and they would come to the Lord for forgiveness, that altar was always ready. And what a wonderful picture that is of Christ. As he says to his people, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And for the child of God, yes, when we're saved, the Lord delivers us from the penalty of our sin and uh, the the guilt of our sin, but it doesn't mean we're sinlessly perfect. That's a side of eternity. And there will be times we'll slip, times that we will fall. And yet it is in those times that the Lord has his blood ready to cleanse us again and again. Now, the, the way it happened outside the door of the tabernacle or that outer court just the, the one opening that there was, and there was only one opening, and then a wee while maybe we'll come to that. That was where the animal was slain. It was slain outside the outer court. Its throat would be cut, and again the blood would be collected. But before that happened, the priest would put his hand upon the head of that animal. And as his hand was on the head of the animal, he would confess his sin. He would confess those things that he had done wrong, those things where he had broken the law of God. And the symbolism here is very clear. His guilt, his sin, was being transferred to that animal. 
only in symbol. And as his sin was transferred to that animal, then that animal lost its life. Then that animal was slain. And that animal died in place of the man who had sinned. And that's a wonderful, wonderful picture of Calvary. That's a wonderful picture of Christ. Again and again in the Old Testament for 14, 1500 years in the tabernacle when it existed and then into the temple and then the Lord Jesus Christ himself came and until the day he died on the cross and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom this was the practice hand on the head of the animal confess your sin your sin transferred to it and it died for you and you could live because it died but when Christ came he, the Bible teaches that he offered himself as one sacrifice for sins forever. So there's all sorts of religions today where there's a confession made to men. Well, that beast, that lamb, was a type of Christ. And my friend, there is where confession starts and finishes. It starts to Christ and it finishes with Christ. There is no room for confessors of men, and no man can forgive sins anyway. But Christ can, because he was our substitute. And so that's how we can go free, because when we come to Christ and our sins are transferred to him, and he died in our place, then because he died in our place, we don't have to die. Our sin transferred to him. Now, as you approach the holy place, through the outer door, you could look through, just part those curtains on the outer door into the outer court, uh, into the tent, or the curtained area, and you would want to go to the, to the elaborate holy place. You would want to go to uh, the holy place and then the holy of holies. But you can't until you come to the brazen altar. Because the brazen altar, its position is inside the court and it is right in front of you. You cannot get into the holy place or the holy of holies without first coming to the altar. It's within the court. Sacrifice for sins is only for those who have entered into Christ through faith. Remember the whole tabernacle speaks of Christ? It's only those who are in Christ can have their sins forgiven. You know, there is a, a doctrine preached today, and it has been preached for years, for decades, for thousands of years, and it's wrong. And this is universalism in that everybody's saved. They teach that God is a God of love, and he is. And they teach that, uh, that God will forgive everybody, whether they repent or whether they don't. And that one day everybody's going to be in heaven. My friend, the Bible doesn't teach that, and neither does the tabernacle. Because only those who are in the tabernacle can get to the sacrifice for them. The Lord Jesus Christ talked about in his earthly ministry, I am the door, the door. Not one of many doors. You know, there are many people today and they talk about uh, my way to God. My friend, all I can say to you is there's a verse that occurs twice in the book of uh, Proverbs, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There's one way to heaven and that's through the one door, and that one door is Christ. You will be saved and ready for heaven if you come to Christ, or you will not enter heaven at all. And that door that gives you entrance into this outer court, that door is Christ. You have got to come to Christ. And when you come to him, the first thing you're confronted with is the cross but only when you've come to Christ. Those who remain on the outside, those who will not come to Christ and come through Christ can have no part in the sacrifice made on the brazen altar. You've got to come through the one and the only door. 
the children sing the, the chorus, one door and only one. And yet it sides are two. The inside, the outside, and which side are you? And that's a good question. There is one door. That one door is Christ. Are you, have you gone through Christ? If you have, then you will absolutely, most certainly, have come to the cross. Because once you come to Christ, once you come through that outer door, you're met with the brazen altar that speaks of the cross. As you face through this door, and you're looking towards this elaborate tent. And this tent, we'll come to the, how it's constructed. The inside of that holy place was made of boards, the walls of it. They were made of this wood as well, but they were covered in solid gold. I mean, the, and the, the menorah was solid gold. The, the altar and the, the table of showbread, they were made of wood covered in solid gold. This was elaborate, but you couldn't get near it. You couldn't get into the presence of God except you first come to the altar. Now, if I tell you, as I've said, the altar speaks of Calvary, you cannot get into the presence of God except through Christ and except you come to the cross. This is the only way to have fellowship with God. Have you been to the cross? Have you been to Calvary? Have you been to that place where the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died by faith? And have you accepted what he did for you as your sacrifice? My friend, if you haven't, you can never go any further. You can never get into the holy place, let alone the holy of holies, which speaks of heaven itself, the very immediate presence of God. You'll never see it unless you first come to the brazen altar. If you look at its materials, made out of this acacia wood again, a wood that's incorruptible, speaking of the humanity of Christ, and yet perfect humanity. And instead of but covered in, in wood, covered in, in gold, this one is covered in brass. This isn't, I suppose you could say this isn't as expensive as the other and certainly it wouldn't take much uh, to buy the brass, even though it was bigger. But there's a particular reason why it was made of brass. If you look at Revelation chapter 1, we have this element mentioned, and it's speaking about uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a picture of Christ in Revelation chapter 1, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned it in the furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. Brass in the Scripture speaks of judgment. Brass speaks of the judgment of God upon sin. There's the, there's the wood and there's the brass, the two natures of Christ, the human incorruptible natures and the incorruptible wood, but then the brass speaking of the unchanging judgment of God. See, Christ did not have to die. He's God. He did not have to die. And because he didn't have to die, he was able to lay down his life. Now, for you and I are concerned, we have to die. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this a judgment. But Christ didn't have to die. Because he is God, because even though God, man, he's perfect. But he chose to die. He said, no man taketh my life from me, Oh, they, they tried to. They plotted it. They had him arrested. They went to Pilate, and they begged him to pass the death sentence and all the rest of it. But they didn't kill him. Do you think that's one of the most wonderful things about the cross? Not that there's many. But you know, all the murderous intent of the, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and the common people of Jerusalem who cried, crucify him, crucify him. We will not have this man to rule over us. Do you know the wonderful thing about Calvary? They wanted to kill him. They tried to kill him, but they, they, were, they were hindered. And God forbid them because Christ was not going to be killed by any man. He said, I laid down my life for my sheep. He voluntarily laid down. When he, when he died, Remember the last saying on the cross? 
Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. His very last act was to discharge his spirit from his body, and that's the definition of death. When your spirit leaves your body, you're dead, and nobody can bring it back, except God. But by an act of his will, he discharged his spirit. He gave his life. No man took it from him, just as he had said. And in all their wanting to kill him and all their devices to kill him, at the end, they were denied the very thing they desired because he was not going to be killed by anyone because he had come to give his life for his people. So Christ didn't have to die. He chose to die. We must die because we're sinners and we must face the judgment of God. Now the word altar here, it means slaughter. What an awful place the altar was. We can look at these things and look at their materials and think that must have been a wonderful thing. All this seven foot six uh, wide and we're four foot six high and all these sacrifices on it. Have you smelt burning flesh? And it burned from morning to night and from night to morning and morning to night. Have you seen the blood upon it? That gives us more of a picture of what Calvary was like than some of these artists', artists impressions that well, it almost seems surreal. There was nothing surreal about Calvary. When you look at its meaning, the altar, as every piece of furniture speaks of Christ, Lord Jesus Christ is the antitype of both the altar, the sacrifice, and the priests. In other words, the altar spoke of Christ, the, the sacrifice on the altar spoke of Christ, and the priest who administered the sacrifice, he spoke of Christ. And Christ fulfilled it all because he was the great high priest, so he administered the sacrifice, but then he was the sacrifice. He offered himself as one sacrifice for sins forever. The type of the brass here, hard brass, it's not the brass that you and I would know, it's, a, it's probably more, uh, more like what we would know as bronze, very, very hard material. And it had much greater resistance to fire than silver or gold. The silver, if it had been covered in silver or covered in gold, when the fire would have burned to that intensity, the gold would have been dripping down it, but not brass. The Savior was the true brazen altar. Only he had the power to endure the intensity of the fire. Now there was great fire that the, the men those wicked men of Jerusalem, when they, when they whipped him and scourged him and nailed him to a cross and crucified him. That was terrible. You could t talk about that as a fiery trial. But my friend, that was nothing. That was nothing compared to what happened in the three hours of darkness when the Father, Jehovah, bade his sword arise, made his sword awake, and it fell on Christ. It was the Father punishing his Son, not for his sins, but for your sins and my sins that had been transferred to him. Remember outside the, outside the, the, the tabernacle that the high priest put his hand on the, on the animal, confessed his sin, and there was that symbolic transference of sin to the animal? And then the animal died in his place. Well, that's exactly what happens with us. When we come to Christ, our sin is transferred to Christ. Not just our sin, but the very guilt of our sin transferred to Christ. And as he hung on the cross, God had to unleash his wrath, his righteous wrath against our awful sin. It wasn't on us anymore, it was on Christ, and that didn't matter. He may have been God's only son, but his wrath had to fall. And so in those three hours of darkness, he had to bear all the wrath 
of God that was due us for sin. It would have taken us an eternity in hell to endure and to pay for such sin against God. And yet in those three hours of darkness, the Lord Jesus Christ suffered the hell that every child of God in all of, it, all of history, he suffered in their place and took that punishment. And it's only because he was able to do it, because he was God. Remember the brazen serpent in the wilderness? It's an interesting study, and the children of Israel had sinned, and the Lord sent fiery serpents, and they bit them, and they were dying all round the place, and they cried to Moses, and Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord said, make a serpent of brass, or a a snake of brass, and put it up on a pole, and whoever looks to it will be saved. Well, that serpent is a picture of Christ. You think, well, that's a very, that's a rough thing to say, that Christ is like a serpent, for of all the animals in all of creation, Surely a snake is the one that you just really wouldn't want to attribute to him. You think of when snake is first mentioned or the serpent, it's when the devil had entered into it and was the instigation of the first sin with Adam and Eve. But there's a reason why that snake that is a picture of Christ was such a thing. Because the Bible says, for he the Father made him the Son to be sin for us. So a proper representation of Christ bearing our sin was not something that was good or pleasant. As far as God the Father was concerned, it was something that was heinous and something that deserved his wrath. The Lord Jesus Christ had to be made the curse for us. Then, if you look at its dimensions, we've already said it's five cubits by five cubits, and a cubit is 18 inches, so that's seven foot six square. Five by five by three, three feet high, or three cubits high, that's four foot six. I suppose that height, seven foot six wide. Now, of course, that are those are into biblical numbers, and numerology and all sorts of things, and there's great value in it. Some people go over the top, and Dr. Paisley was a great man for numbers, and it's amazing, those who are old enough to remember him preach, he brought many wonderful things out of numbers in the Scriptures. But five is a number of grace. Nowhere other than the cross of Christ and Calvary was the grace of God more displayed to poor sinners. The grace was as long as time began because the Lord Jesus Christ is described as a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. As far as God was concerned, when he decided to send his son, it was as though it had already happened. He was a lamb slain before he said, let there be light. Of course, it was the son who said, let there be light, for he's the word. And the grace of God goes way back before the beginning of time. The grace of God is as broad because all who who want to come to Christ can. It's four square. That's the word I think that's used in verse one, four square. It points, you know those horns? Horn at each corner that we read there, pointing north, south, east, and west. Pointed everywhere. And the Bible teaches us that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it doesn't matter who you are tonight. It doesn't matter what you've done. The grace of God can reach you. And the grace of God is nowhere better demonstrated than the cross of Christ at Calvary. And there the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God but it's only through him. The grace of God, or grace is something that we don't deserve. It's unmerited favor. Someone has put it in an acrostic form, God's riches at Christ's expense, and that describes it. That's grace, something that we don't deserve. You and I don't deserve to get to heaven, but we can, but only through Christ. 
He's the one door. It's only when our sins are laid on Him and He has taken our sins on the cross at Calvary, only then can we enter into the holy place and into the holy of holies and have a fellowship with God. Then there's the great. This seven foot six square altar, four foot six high, it was just a surround. And if you looked over the top of it, you just about see over the four foot six, you could see almost to the ground, but you couldn't because there was a great seven foot six some place down. And it was on this grate that these, uh, these animals for sacrifice were made. And the animals were put on there and they would be burning. And before the other one was finished burning, there was another one put on and it just never stopped. The morning sacrifice lasted to the evening and the evening right through to the next morning. And it was all here on the grate. The altar was five by five by three cubits and so was the grate. You think, well, why tell us that? What's the point in telling us that there was a great there? Well, whether there is or whether there isn't, is it of any big account? Well, it is. Because everything on that altar was burnt completely. It's talked sometimes when you look at studies of the study the, the the offerings, it's often described as the whole burnt offering. Burnt so completely there was nothing left of any part of it, bones or whatever, so burnt completely that it all fell down through the grate. And when we think of the sacrifice that Christ made for us on the cross at Calvary, it was a complete sacrifice. He gave his all that we might go free. You know, some people think that, well, he was God and he just did a wee bit of this, did a wee bit of that, and that's all. And it was Christ gave his all. When the sacrificial animal which spoke of Christ was placed on that, it was killed and the blood taken, and the blood sprinkled on the horns of the altar, and the the carcass put upon the, the, the grate and burnt. It was burnt till there was nothing left. And the Lord Jesus Christ gave everything. Is it any wonder when uh, those three hours of darkness were over, he cried, it is finished. Nothing more to give. He gave us all. Gives us a glimpse at the inward suffering of Christ. What we could see outwardly was terrible. What we could see outwardly if you had stood at the cross, of course his disciples weren't there, Seems the only one that ever got there, even when he was late coming, was John. All the rest forsook the Lord and fled. One of them had, one of them had uh, betrayed him. And all the awful things that men did to the Lord, that was bad. But as I say, what, what God the Father did to Christ, it's on, it's on you couldn't describe it. Words couldn't describe it. If I could describe it, you couldn't understand it. And it was all shrouded in darkness. In the three hours that God rained his son, rained his wrath upon his son, he shut out the world. He said, you're not going to watch this. Often wondered why. Is it that men could not have endured to see the awful suffering that Christ would endure in those three hours, would it have killed them even to look at it? It's a possibility. Or is it because it was such a a holy transaction that God was not going to have these vile, filthy rebels who had tried to murder his son? He wasn't allowing them to have any part Christ did not need any help to make the sacrifice for sins. He bore it all, and he bore it all alone. And so when that transaction was done between father and son, some people say, well, it was where I come in. The only bit that we come into that is our sin laid on Christ, 
As far as the transaction and the cross was concerned, it was between God the Father and the Son. That's it. Our only part was the sinning. Christ's part, the bearing our sin, and the Father's part, reigning His wrath that was due us on Christ. So the brazen altar, a wonderful place, a place that speaks of Christ, it speaks of Calvary. I want to ask you tonight, have you been there? Maybe you're listening online and you've never been to the cross. If you want to have fellowship with God, if you want to get into the, the, uh, the holy place, then the holy of holies, holy of holies is, has no light source. Um, the brazen candlestick, the bra- or the golden candlestick outside of the holy place uh, lit the holy place, but when you get into the holy of holies, 15 feet square, covered over the top and round, no light. And yet the brightest part of it. Because the light of the glory of God, sometimes referred to in the, in, uh, in the scriptures as the Shekinah glory of God, because God himself was there dwelling between those two angels, the cherub, cherubim. And the light of the glory of God filled that place. And you know, it's interesting when you come to heaven, there's no need of candle, for the Lamb is the light thereof, just like the Holy of Holies. But my friend, if you want to be in the presence of God, and you want to be in, the, in, the, in heaven where Christ is the very light of the place, you can only get there when you first come to the cross. You have to come through the door by faith in Christ, for he is the door. But immediately you come to him, you've got to be at the cross. And there your sin is dealt with. And then, then you can proceed towards the holy place, the place of fellowship with God. There's only one thing that impedes your view of the holy place when you've come to the, the brazen altar, it's the laver, a place of washing. And there's significance in that. And you'll have to wait a few weeks to we'll look at that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee, Lord, for thy hand upon us tonight. We praise thee, Lord, for Calvary. We praise thee, Lord, for the brazen altar that speaks of the cross work of Christ. Help us, Lord, to realize, Lord, that it was a terrible place. Help us to realize, Lord, it was terrible because of our sin. Had we not sinned, our sin would not have been on him, and the wrath of God would not have had to fall. But help us to realize, Lord, that we are the reason that he had to endure such terrible suffering. And we thank thee, Lord, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but of everlasting life. Take us to the cross tonight. Help us, Lord, appreciate in a greater measure what Christ has done for us. And Lord, if there are those listening who are not saved, Lord, bring them to Christ tonight, Christ who is the only door. Bring them, Lord, then through that door to the cross, the only place where sin can be dealt with and forgiveness found. Lord, may they come to thee tonight. Separate us in thy fear and with thy blessing, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.